Hey there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. It's time for another installment of Ask Crafter. This video is going to be answering questions from the second Ask a Crafter thread on my community channel. I will actually put in notation on the Ask a Crafter threads that I've already filmed so that nobody puts their questions in the wrong spot. If you would like your question answered in an up upcoming Ask a Crafter, just go to my YouTube channel so if you just search a Frugal Crafter or you click on my name, like under this video, it'll take you to my channel page and then just look at the top and you can see, like, uh, it'll say videos, um, home, community, whatever. You click on community and that's where you find the place to leave the questions. That's the only place I'm pulling the questions from. Not the not the um, the comments in this video um, or on my blog. It's just too many places to look. So. They, that's where they are, so if you want your question considered, put it there, and then what I do is I choose the ones with the most votes. So I had 94 uh, questions on this thread, and so I am going to answer all the ones that have more than 10 upvotes or thumbs ups on them, and that's about 15 questions. So I will be answering them over two or three videos. So if, you're, um, if the question had more than 10 thumbs ups at the time I'm recording, then, then they'll be answered in one of these videos. So I hope that makes things clear. Um, and then when you are looking at questions, if you post a question or if you're just looking to see what other people have asked, put a thumbs up on the ones you like. So that way the, um, the ones with the highest number will get answered. And it might not be 10 next time, it might be 20, it might be five. It, it just depends on, on how many questions there are because I can only you know answer so many in a video. Um, and then if I get you know too many, the videos will be so far in the future that people forgot they asked a question and forgot to watch. So I just try to keep it timely that way I and, and fair. So hopefully it is. So here we go. The first question um, is actually really tough. It is posted by Kate and she asks, Hi Lindsay, one question. I've always wanted to ask you this. If you were only allowed to use 10 crafting painting artist supplies for one year, what 10 supplies or products would you choose? Um, and that had the most votes and there are several other comments after that saying that they also would love to know. Um, and man, that is really tough. I would have to say, and I'm gonna have to count out on my hand, on my fingers, because <laughs> otherwise I will just keep adding and adding and adding. Uh, I would say my palette of Engram watercolors, Arches watercolor paper, my Creative Mark Mimic brushes, um, Prismacolor pencils, probably pan pastels, um, Copic markers, Nina Classic Crest cardstock, <sighs> stamps. Can I just use stamps as like a? I can. Can I write? <laughs> um, memento ink pads and archival ink, I guess, because that way I could do, um, I could work with watercolor marker, markers, pastel, and color pencil, um, because I can use, and I could use both of those papers, well, I could use the color pencils on probably most likely the watercolor paper, but I could also use it on the cardstock. I think that would probably be the most well-rounded use, but I don't know, that's tough. That's really, that's really tough for someone that does so many different types of projects, but I think that's what it would be. And you know, I'm saying Copic markers just because uh, I'm thinking that if I only have, if I've got to make them last for a year, then I know I can get refills for them. So that would be, it could be whatever markers. Um, and I just knew the tips won't fray and you know, they would hold up. But, uh, um, so uh, I guess that would be it. The next question is from the Joyce of Arts. Um, are there daily or regular watercolor practices that us newbies can do to practice things like brush control? And uh, that's a really long question, so... Um, yeah, so I'm just going to answer that first question because there's it goes on for, for quite a long, long time there. Um, yeah, I would definitely say, and you don't have to use your expensive paper, you can just take a brown paper grocery bag and a brush and a cup of water and try practicing thin and thick lines. So take your round brush, start with it up on its point and start dragging a stroke as you press your brush down to the paper more and then keep dragging it as you lift your brush up and that's going to show you how to control 
how thick or thin your lines are. Um, you can try, it'll also get you used to how much water you need to have on your brush in order to keep your stroke from breaking up. I would practice that. Um, another technique you could practice, but you do need watercolor paper. It doesn't have to be the best watercolor paper in the, the world, but it's got to be a decent watercolor paper. And you need a board to tape it to, or it could be cardboard, it could be anything, but you need it so that you can tip it up. And uh, draw rectangles. And then what you want to do on your paper is mix up like a puddle of color, and I want, would want you to practice a controlled wash. And a controlled wash is when you make a bead of water, a watercolor across the top of your rectangle, whatever shape, but a rectangle is good for, for practice. And you fill that bead up with as much water and paint as you can. And then you work going back and forth, back and forth, basically making a stroke right underneath. And you pull that bead down and as you start to run out, you pick up more color and you add it to the bead and you keep on working. And you want to practice that until you can do a full rectangle that's completely flat and seamless color. Uh, th those two techniques I think would would really help you more than anything else as a beginner watercolorist. If you want more help with that, I have a course, Essential Tools and Techniques for Watercolor Painting, and it shows you that technique and a bunch of other techniques that you really need to know to get going in watercolor. It's designed to be a very, um, a very practical course to get, help you get to know your supplies, get to know um, the techniques, and then paint for paintings with me so that you can get put those techniques into practice. So I highly recommend that if you're new and you need some more training. And uh, I'll link that down below in the video description so you can uh, so you can find it easily. Let's see, the next one is from uh, Laura Thompson. I uh, wish you could show us more cards and some of the funky fold. Okay, so they're one they're wondering about um, how do you make those kind of special effects cards without buying all the pricey dies? Like Lawn Font has a bunch of dies that show you how to make iris cards and um, different things like that. So what I would recommend, it's actually another another viewer um, chimed in and, and offered some advice. Um, Split Coast Stampers has a whole resources section with lots of the tutorials for those cards. There was also another website, I'm not sure if it's still around, but it was called Mirkwood Designs and they had a lot of templates for those things. But you can really search just about any type of card, like an iris card or a stair step card or an easel card and find tutorials for those very easily. And I have a book, it's called um, Mechanical Cards and I picked it up used at a bookstore a couple of years ago but I'll, if I can find it on Amazon I'll link it down below that has a lot of those um, those cards that you know you buy the expensive dies for I mean the, some of those die sets are like 30 or 40 dollars and how many times are you gonna make those elaborate cards I know I am NOT even though they look so cool but I'd never buy those dies because I'm like I would make that once and that would be one expensive card because it would be forty dollars just for the dies or whatever and stamps so um yeah, definitely check out the resources at Split Coast Stampers and uh, the book called Mechanical Cards. Let's see, next one, um, let's see, Asia asks, I often find it hard to make smooth, non-wiggly lines when using watercolor. How do I fix this problem or should I embrace my messiness? Well, there's a couple different things you can do, Asia. You can um, try to, to draw from the shoulder if you can, so move your whole arm. I find that when you're moving your whole arm, it tends to, um, with, rather than just moving your wrist, if you're just moving your wrist, you're more likely to, I think, wiggle and shake. If you're moving your whole arm, you're more likely to get a more, a more fluid stroke. That would be one thing. Another thing you can do is actually put your arm down and put your other arm across and like use that as kind of like a guide or a bridge. Or if you're working, um, at a, well, she's talking about watercolor, but if you were working at an easel, then you could use a mall stick, which is like a, looks like a drumstick with a, with like a pad on the end, and you would just set that against the edge of your painting, and then you'd rest your arm against it. But uh, those are great ways to kind of reduce the wiggle, but if you just have a, a tremor and, and you can't, um, you can't get it to smooth out there, then embrace it. That's part of your style, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, go with it. Okay, Yells Yells asks, asked, I have some good quality paints. I have Paul Rubin, Windsor Newton Professional, but feel the paper is not, I use is not adequate for these paints to do them justice. Um, all right, she is asking for a paper recommendation. Okay, so if you have big, kind of like 100% cellulose, very inexpensive paper, the next step up you could take would be like a blend, like a cellulose and cotton paper blend. Fabriano Studio makes these. They make them in hot press, which I absolutely love. They're hot press for stamping and watercoloring. They also have a cold press version. I don't think they have a rough. A rough. I think it's just hot press or cold press. 
you can get those in 140 pound. I would recommend that heavier weight versus the 90 if you're going to be painting on them. And that is a great transition paper. Um, other than that, you're pretty much going to be going up to the more professional papers. I think any paper that's 100% cotton is going to be pretty good for you, and you're going to notice that uh, that the paints look a lot better on them. My favorite is Arches. I also like Hannah Mule Cezanne. Actually, I would say they're pretty much equivalent, Hannah Mule Cezanne or Arches. I think Cezanne's a little bit smoother. If you want a, um, a paper that's, that's a little bit smoother than that still, I would recommend the Fabriano Artistico Soft Press. It's not as smooth as a hot press, but it's not as rough as a cold press, so Artistico and any of their, any of their papers are good. Um, also, uh, the Canson Heritage paper is pretty nice. You can find that at big, big box stores and you can use a coupon, and that's probably what I recommend doing. Look for a 100% cotton watercolor paper at your local big box store, but use a coupon on it so it brings it down to more like what you would pay at Blick or Jerry's. But if they're selling it at the big box store and it is a 100% cotton paper, it's probably Arches or Canson Heritage or Artistico or one of the more tried and true brands because there's a lot of great papers out there, but there's also a lot of, um, a lot of stinkers and you you know, you just don't want to take a gamble if you're spending that much money for paper. So that would be my recommendation either. If you want, you know, to kind of take a little step up, go with Fabriano Studio. But if you want to, you know, really get a better paper, and it sounds like you do since you're using professional watercolors, go for Arches, go for one of the tried and true. Hannah Mule is great. They're just harder to find in our, in America, but they might be easier to find in Europe if you're in Europe. Uh, their papers are excellent. But I like the uh, Cezanne probably the best. I also like their Expression, I think it is. But some people don't like the texture of the expression. I really didn't notice it being that uh, that odd. But um, but there are some good options for you. I used to really recommend the the B watercolor paper, but that's really hard to find. And if you can, it's quite expensive. It used to be like the the cheapest 100% cotton paper you could find. But um, but I don't know what happened to that. Uh, okay, yeah, and if the questions are super long, I'm paraphrasing or taking the first question out of a group that they've asked because it's just, uh, it's uh, too much to read on camera. Um, Angela asks, hi, Lindsay. Uh, currently, I'm interested in collage abstract art. Do you have or have you ever tried collage? And if you have, would you consider making a video or videos on that subject? Angela, I use collage when I'm scrapbooking and when I'm card making, so you could check out some of my kind of more artsy card making videos or like I just did one that was um, using stickers in your design and there was quite a bit of collage in there. So you can check those out, but I'm typically not a collage artist. I did a video a couple of years ago about the collages that hang over my mantle, um, but I typically don't work in collage that much. There are lots of channels that do. Um, shoot, I'm trying to, her name is Robin Marie something. Uh, but there's a lot of collage artists on YouTube. I would definitely look at someone who does that all the time for inspiration rather than someone who only does it when they're making cards or, um, or scrapbook layouts. So, uh, so that would be my advice. Sorry, I can't help you too much. I'm just not a, not, you know, much of a collage artist. Uh, Jesse B asks, I have a hard time distinguishing cool and warm varieties of different colors. I mentally know, but my eyes don't seem to. Are there common names that automatically tell you so that you can mix colors better? I'm asking more about acrylic mixing than with watercolor. Um, I would say, don't think about warm and cool so much when you're looking at the colors and thinking about how they mix. Think color friends. So if you're looking, if you're trying to mix an orange, for instance, and you've got, say you've got permanent rose and you've got cadmium red and you've got lemon yellow and you've got um, new gamboge or cadmium yellow. So you're looking at those colors and you're like, what red and what yellow do I pick? Well, look at a color wheel if you have one or just look at those colors and ask yourself, does this red look more like orange already or does this red look more like pink or purple already? So the cadmium or red is gonna look more like orange and the permanent rose is gonna look more like purple. So you take the colors that are already closer to what you wanna mix. And so for yellows, if you wanna make an orange, you would look at cadmium yellow or gamboge and that already has yellow uh, orange undertones. So that one looks more like orange already, whereas lemon yellow looks more like green. So what you wanna do is find your color friends and your color friends are who stands next to each other on the color wheel. So you wanna go for colors that already kind of look like the color you're trying to mix or look closest to the color you're trying to mix rather than worrying about warm and cool undertones. I think that would help you uh, so much more when you're trying to learn how to mix paint in whatever medium you want to mix them in. 
Let's see. And uh, this next question is from Kim, and this will be the last question for this episode. How to glue watercolor paper to cardstock without it coming apart later? Okay, she's been using pop dots, but she'd like to find something that's a little less wasteful. Well, I honestly use um, my, well, I usually am not gluing watercolor paper to cardstock, but say if I'm making a greeting card and I'm gonna mount it to cardstock, I generally will use my um, my ATG gun. It's a, I can show you, I've got it right here. It's this thing right here. And it's just a double-sided tape runner. And I like this one because the refills are pretty inexpensive. I buy them from Tape Depot, but I think Amazon also sells bulk refills. But these are like, uh, I don't know if they're, I can't remember what I paid. I'm thinking they're like around a dollar, I paid like a dollar twenty-five a roll or something for that. So, um, so that's what I use. I've also used a score tape. That's a really heavy-duty double-sided tape if your paper tends to warp. A lot. You could also use just matte medium or any acid-free white glue and put it on the back of the painting, put it on the cardstock, put wax paper on top and put a book on it and it will be nice and flat. And uh, it will get the job done for very cheap. Well, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, make sure you tune in to Ask a Crafter every week to hear the other questions from this thread over in the YouTube community. And I will put a new thread up for questions for upcoming videos. So if you do want to ask a question, make sure you look at the most recent Ask a Crafter thread over on my YouTube channel page under the community tab. Thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you liked it. Until next time, happy crafting.